To truck it, I'm Dooner, and that's the dude. Hey, good uh, <laughs> afternoon from a very, very soggy freight alley. <laughs> it was, <laughs> yeah, it was coming down. Night, huh? It was coming down horrible last night. I, I, if you've never been yeah. to Chattanooga, one Whew. thing about this place, when it rains, it, rains. it really pours. Yeah, and it certainly does. It comes down three road closures on my way to work today. I count the the rain. My that's my rain gauge. How many roads closed in Middle Valley on my way to work? Yeah, <laughs> it rained pretty good. Three of them. That's pretty good rain. Well, we got some big news, right? We got some yeah. big news. So, what the truck is expanding, right? You want right. to join us up here? Maybe on the show. Maybe really? writing articles. Maybe making TikToks. Maybe making memes. Back the truck up is the Barstool Sports of Freight, and it's being built right here, right now, under this roof at Freight Waves in Chattanooga in Freight Alley. There you go. I'm running the thing. We're hiring some people. We're bringing them on board. Hope to launch this uh, this spring. It's going to be a good time. If you are interested at all, like we love perspectives yeah. of people in this industry too. So if you are a driver out there, you have a, a strong perspective on this, sure. right? Sure, But sure, you can sure. also add some levity to the conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah Reach yeah. out and apply. You're a broker out there. You know the struggles of the broker. Can also make fun of it a little bit. Apply. <laughs> Tduner at FreightWaves.com. Right. T-D-O-O-N-E-R at FreightWaves.com to get that information. It's going to be an amazing time. Absolutely. Well, hey, you know who doesn't care? I mean, you know who pulls no punches and will like let it hang out there, be good at candidate? Looking for a, a new career, maybe. <laughs> Phil Mickelson. <laughs> <laughs> I heard he said some things that might not have been so good on the, on the P about the PGA, and uh, maybe he maybe he'll be applying. He'll be applying to the job. Yeah, I would could be. I would. I don't know. I don't know if we necessarily have room for him. By the we way, some him. big news that has been uh, some big news that has been going on right now yeah. is that people's convoy. I wrote about it oh, last yeah. night in the What the Truck newsletter because it's confusing. It's a confusing situation, and you're reading all different mainstream articles by parachute journalists, and I think that they're conflating a lot of things. So we're just going to break down a little bit of what we know right here. Uh, first of all, they're in Barstow, California, right now. I was actually just watching a live stream. They're doing staging over there. It didn't look like a massive gap. Granted, in California at the time, the live stream was about 8 a.m. in the morning. I think that they said they're pushing off at 10 a.m. Pacific time. Concurrently, you're also seeing reports of what's going on with like the National Guard in D.C. and concerns over the Beltway. That is a separate protest. So there's, uh, there's someone over in Pennsylvania, in Scranton, Pennsylvania area. This guy, uh, Bob... I actually don't want to say his name if I don't know it off the top of my head. Yeah, let's This guy, Bob, and so they call him Bob up in Scranton. He is bringing a smaller convoy. He's a tow truck driver. He said that they're going to encircle the beltway like a boa constrictor, but there's no clear indication of how many people were involved in this gentleman's group. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> They're going to encircle it? <laughs> like well, I don't know if he's just going with his tow truck alone or he has an entire group with him. Yeah, um, that, that's very interesting. And So coming out of Adelanto, California as well. Was there, was that there how the many? One. Yeah, so yeah, it's yeah, the Barso yeah. at Adelanto Stadium. Right. That's the one that's taking off from there. It's supposed to, their itinerary is interesting. So there's been a lot of concern. Is this going to arrive for the State of the Union? Their own itinerary says not. It says that this is an 11 day drive. They're not going to be there for the State of the Union. However, I'm not entirely sure on that one. We'll see. Yeah, I don't know. We're not 100% sure if this has been hijacked or not. Right? Not is that what you're kind of saying? I mean, if it's the or if Well, it's, it's not off. really the original guys, is it? We, do we know that? That we were talking to before, before all this started. Is it the original guys? That yeah, Brian Brace is the okay. one who's still doing that. Okay, so he's still there. All right. It makes yes. me feel a little bit more confident on what's going on there because that's that's interesting to me. Well, this one, too, it's not as well-funded, the People's Convoy. It's not as okay. well-funded as the ones you heard up there were the GoFundMe that had raised around $10 million Canadian dollars and the Give, Send, Go, which had also raised around $10 million Canadian dollars, Michael Vincent. Those those ones were big. Those ones also got shut down and money got seized. And if you've been paying attention up right. in Canada, uh, certain backers, their bank accounts have been frozen. Um, this one they've raised, according to their own website, it says $300. 11,362. So not nearly the funding. It doesn't look from the parking lot like it's the scope of it. It is a long drive. I don't know if they're uh, if they're going to pick up others along the way. The convoy route has a lot of different pickup points. And I know that because of the situation in Canada, a lot of the groups have been uh, 
on edge. I think all parties are on edge, right? You've got DC on edge. You've got people who are against it who are on edge, people afraid of a January 6th type incident. They're afraid it might have been, as you mentioned, hijacked. There's even people who I I don't know if they're hearing too many, reading too many headlines today, but they're they're saying, oh, is this set up, is a people's convoy set up by Putin? Yeah, right? And it's an attempt to destroy the, the uh, what, Biden, Harris, Harris Biden's uh, stuff in his businesses in Ukraine. There's all kinds of crazy conspiracy theories going on. The one that concerns me the most is this. Just the reaction from the Canadian government that has happened up there, that's the slope that I hope we don't go down here. And I think that's got a lot of people on the edge of some of the stuff that freezing bank accounts and looking for people who are people of... Uh, what do they call them? Not people of interest. I guess they did call them people of interest who or help organizing this type of stuff and maybe freezing those bank accounts as well. Some of the reaction that goes there and maybe over uh, reaction by some law enforcement, uh, understandably, if they think they're in a, you know, January 6th type of situation, right? I would think so. I mean, they're putting the fencing up back up there. The organizers of these protests, if you look at the messaging, like People's Convoy, they, they make it very clear that the intent actually isn't to go into downtown Washington, D.C. I right. think these, these groups are uh, aware of what the response would be if, sure. they, if they go in there, especially after what yeah. we just saw in Canon, obviously because you know the, the, that area is going to be incredibly overprotective because of what happened on 1-6. Um, there's another convoy, too, the American Freedom Convoy. And this is why this is sort of confusing, because they're all supposed to be arriving on different dates. They're all coming from different areas. The American Freedom Convoy, this is another small one, co-organized by, this one's by a nurse, Nicole Robinson. That's uh, starting March 1st, going to arrive in D.C. to March 7th. But when you look at some of these, you know, what was really, what was really captivating about the Freedom Convoy was yeah. that it's really rare for a trucking protest to take hold. We haven't seen a big one of the scope of the Freedom Convoy since the 1970s. Yeah, what was the last one? They was it Stop the Wheels or something like that? Was it, Stop the Tires. Or Stop the Tires. Stop yeah, the yeah. Tires. Um, and what happens, a lot of times these are organized by people who are not truck drivers. They try to put yeah. trucking in there because it becomes in vogue. Um, and that doesn't mean that every driver supports this. So when you're using rhetoric and engaging with drivers too, understand that, that they're not necessarily for or against uh, these kind of things. No, they're absolutely. It's hard. It's the hijacking of things that 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 really gets uh, scary. And, and like you said, it's a long way to go across there. I like the fact, like you said, they're putting out there what they intend to do once they get there, what their plans are, so that there isn't this overreaction or this total scare that's going to. They're yeah. trying to make a point. They're trying to make things uh, be uh, uh, you know discussed and talked about uh, without you know harming the economy and 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 you know, threatening people's lives, I guess, is what they're trying to do, right? Trying to keep it smooth and trying to talk about these things and just give enough enough out there so that it is talked about. And hopefully they get that done. I hope they do. Well, how do you protest now? Like, how do I don't know. How are you supposed to protest? If you are, to take them at the word, and I know a lot of people don't, but if you are, that it's just about mandates, and a group of drivers wants to protest that, how do they go about doing it legally in our own country? I don't know. This is going to be a really interesting week, especially if this thing grows and gets bigger. Obviously, we hope cooler heads prevail. Everyone stays safe. Everyone stays cool out there. And, uh, you know, get your voice out there. But... Uh be safe. You know, we've seen yeah, what's going on. Yeah, get it out there and be safe. And I agree with you. It's an interesting week. And, and if you're not paying attention to it, you really should, because our ability to gather and protest and uh, is is one of our rights under the Constitution, right? And we don't, certainly don't want those to be taken away. Unfortunately, sometimes you see people go too far and you think, well, we need to crack down on some of this stuff a little bit uh, when things get out of control. We'll see how it goes. We'll see how it goes. Anyways, this episode is brought to you by Surge Transportation. They think non-competes are stupid. Non-competes chase away good talent and stop talented people from joining the supply chain industry. Tear up your non-compete. It's not enforceable. Email jobs at searchtransportation.com instead. And do what? Hey, open your own office tomorrow. Cool. We got Lauren Began here, principal we founder do. over at Squall Strategies. Lauren, are you with us today? Hello, I'm here. All right. So you had uh, some quick news flashes to drop on us. One of them was uh, the FMC releasing their advance notice of proposed rulemaking. Lauren, what's up with that? What does that mean? Right, so alphabet soup, so it's the ANPRM, the Advanced Notice of Proposed Rulemaking. So what the FMC, the Federal Maritime Commission, is doing is they're, they're releasing the pre, pre, pre-stages of a rulemaking for detention and demerge. You know, I've been on here before. We always talk about detention and demerge. They're trying to put some guardrails in place, not strict rules necessarily, but guardrails. And they're asking the industry, what guardrails do you think would help make the industry fairer? Um, so this advanced notice of proposed rulemaking, they have three different things that they're covering. The scope, 
Who should be included in this new rule? Should it also include MTOs and NVOCCs? That it's clear it's already going to include VOCCs. But should it also include ports and MTOs and NVOs? Um, and then it'll also look at minimum billing information. So should the FMC include the period being billed for in the requirements? I mean, there's no real requirements right now for billing. Should, should there be? Um, and then it's also going to look at billing practices. So billing invoice timelines. Should you be required to invoice within 60 days of the occurrence of the detention and emerge? You know, sometimes people are getting invoices three years later. How the heck are you supposed to know what happened? The, the, the ability to fight that invoice really goes down. And the FMC acknowledges that when they release the SAN PRM. There's text that talks a lot more about these three different areas. But if you have thoughts on detention and demurrage, submit comments. They, they want comments from the industry. This is the early, early stages, like I said, where the FMC really wants to hear from the industry. They're putting it out to the industry with these questions, these three different areas, and they want to hear from the industry. Examples, stories, thoughts that you have, um, you know, say who you are, say your role in the industry, and let them know. They want to know. It's really, really interesting, Lauren. There's a lot of questions on everything that you just said, and I know it's just these are the, the issues that they're putting out there, so there's not really any decisions that are being making or made or anything like that. But the big question that comes into my mind is once they put this together, thoughts on being able to enforce some of these things, right? Because some of these bills and et cetera are not coming from U.S. entities. Well, so so that the FMC can actually control um, – the ability to, to, to use our ports, to, to use the, the U.S. side of things. So, you know, that's where, that's where the hook. If you remove the U.S. from the market, from some of these um, offshore entities, I mean, you, that, that's the threat. That's, that's the danger. So, um, you know, they, they can still control it even though they're not um, U.S.-based. And, and for that matter, they still need to file, um, you know, their tariffs, their everything to be able to do business in the U.S. So the FMC still has a, an ability to hook into these foreign country, foreign companies. Gotcha. One other question for you, Lauren. What is the newly still being created DOT Office of Freight? Sure. So, you know, this was, this was something that I wanted to dive into. I was finding that it's hard to find information on this. And the Biden-Harris administration's port envoy, John Picard, we've talked about him before, announced this week that he's going to be, or last week, that he's going to be stepping down in March. And he's predicating that departure on the creation of the newly, you know, talked about Office of Policy, this Office of Multimodal Freight Infrastructure Policy. So, so you know, I went to the text. Aren't you glad you have an attorney that you can call to learn more about what's going on? Um, but yeah. so it's, it's the, uh, it was part of the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act that was passed by Congress in November. This was part of the infrastructure bill. Um, and it's, it's a new office. Um, they're going to be responsible for grant administration, so that's money. Um, they're going to be responsible for coordination of state multimodal freight plans, um, overseeing research, and, and really just being the liaison office, kind of mirroring what Port Envoy John Picari has been doing between public and private stakeholders. So they're looking towards the, the future to try and ensure that we have a, a, a good infrastructure to avoid some of the issues we've had in the past couple of years. Well, that's right. You know, and they really want to make sure there really wasn't a come together office. You know, we have all these different modes over at Department of Transportation, but we didn't really have one that covered everything. So I'm encouraged here, um, you know, to kind of have this all modes under one regulatory, or not even, it's not even regulatory, it's a grant um, and research oversight uh, group. So, you know, to, to have somebody dedicated to that, to streamlining all of DOT's work um, under this freight umbrella. Excellent, Lauren. Well, the two, two important things we're going to keep our eyes on. Uh, for more information about as well, I know you post about these topics and you also talk about them on your show. Go ahead and plug that. Sure. Yeah. So I'm, I'm the host of By Land and By Sea. I'm your favorite maritime attorney. Um, but, you know, I kind of break down all the things that are happening in the supply chain that week. But also you can find me on LinkedIn, Lauren Began, um, and I have a company, Squall Strategies. So in case you do need an attorney for any of these reasons, uh, feel free to reach out to me via that company. But everything we talked about today was just educational, as, as all attorneys have to hook that. This is not <laughs> legal attorney privilege. Sure, we go. hear you, Lauren. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Take it easy. Thanks, guys. Great to have. Great to be on. Good, <laughs> right on. good stuff with her. Good stuff yeah. with her. Now, it's go ahead. No, go. Uh, I was just going to say it's really good to see these things happening right now, it, it, because as we've known, the maritime industry and, the, and the, the trade that is there is very, very essential to our economy. So it's good to see that they're starting to look into some of these things. I, I would say so. I would you know, say. I mean, do you think they're looking in the right direction? 
Well, I, that I'm not 100% sure of. I, I think one of the things that I'm encouraged by is the fact that they're, you know, the advanced notice of proposed rulemaking uh, kind of seems like we don't know what the hell to do, so you tell us. But they're also listening. Hopefully they will listen and get the right ideas in their heads because when you go begging to the, to the government for control, uh, sometimes they take too much. Yeah, uh, and, and maybe not necessarily their fault. You know what I'm saying? I, I saw some tweets out there. You know, you scare people long enough, and they start begging you to take away their freedoms. <laughs> could be. You could be. I mean? <laughs> yeah, you got to be careful, man. We're close to the line. We're close to the line yep. here. Hey, by the way, we got Britton Weston on now. He sells development over at JB Hunt Transportation Services. Britton, last time he was on here, crooned for us, sang us a wonderful song. He may even oh, do the same right. today. Britton, thank you for coming back yeah. on What the Truck. Hey, fellas, good to be back. Um, I appreciate the invitation to be on the show. Uh, yeah, no, I wish we could see our, 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 our live camera system, a little behind the scenes inside baseball, our live camera system, like crashed literally as yeah. we went live on air. So we've got you here on a call in, but you sound beautiful. You sound perfect. What, uh, what number did you have in mind for us today? You know, I've got a buddy out there that I've known for a long time, great musician. His name is Drew Holcomb. And for everybody in the trucks out there, if you need music in your cab, Drew Holcomb and the Neighbors, you need to get them playing in there. And so I've got one of my favorite songs that Drew does that I thought I'd do for you guys today. Hey, Britton, you good. know that he does like Three Rivers Festival out here, right? Isn't it Three, we're three Rivers Festival? Uh, Riverfront. River Fest. River Bend. Yep. River Bend. Yep. River Bend. <laughs> cool. We yeah, go all man. the time doing and I. We're big fans. <laughs> Take it away, Britton. Yeah. <laughs> All right, this is a song by Drew uh, called Dragons. Here we go. I was climbing a mountain, sleeping in the moonlight. The ghost of my grandpa came to me in a dream. As the stars hung above us, he started singing this chorus. He laughed loud as heaven and said this to me. Go take a few chances, a few worthy romances. Go swimming in the ocean on New Year's Day. Don't listen to the critics. Stand up and bear witness. Go slay all the dragons that stand in your way. We stayed up and talked until sunrise. War and love and sorrow. He said, stop spending all your money on forgiveness of sin. Today is all you promise. Don't trouble with tomorrow. And he faded into the forest, proudly singing this hymn. Take a few chances, a few worthy romances. Go swimming in the ocean on New Year's Day. Don't listen to the critics. Stand up and bear with Go slay all the dragons that stand in your way. I woke up in a fever, surrounded by the light. All my windows were open. I let the rain flood in. The past felt like present. With a future uncertain, but I sing like a sparrow lost in the wind. I sing, take a few chances, a few worthy romances. Go swimming in the ocean on New Year's Day. Don't listen to the critics. Stand up and bear witness. Go slay all the dragons. Stand in your way. Very nice yeah. job, Britton. That was that was Slay great. Some dragons, man. That was great. We gotta get you in Thank studio. You know, all credit, all Amen. credit to Drew and, and his team that writes this music, man. They're just fantastic. Now Amen. we understand that you also just had the honor of performing taps for Wreath Across America, Wreaths Across America. That was very cool. Yeah, yeah. We uh JB Hunt is big on veterans and veteran appreciation and hiring veterans. And I uh, had the distinct honor of playing for the Reeves Across America ceremony uh, that we had at J.B. Hunt. And that was uh, quite an honor. My granddad was a veteran, uh, World War II in Korea. So it runs deep in our family. So it was a, very much a personal thing for me as well. 
Well, Michael, Vincent, you wow. know that we are going to be out in Northwest Arkansas May 9th to 10th, right, That's for right. our Future of Supply Chain Festival, right in your stomping grounds over there, Britain. i got to tell you, we're out of that festival. Yeah. I do hope you stop by. Maybe you can play a live track for us on air at the, at the uh, event. Hey, let's – man, I would love to make that happen, guys. I would absolutely love it and to represent J.B. Hunt and um, share some tunes. Man, that'd be – I would absolutely love that opportunity, Yes. Absolutely. Well, we'll talk about. Well, I'll I'll give you some more details uh, off air, and we'll figure out how to get you over there. I'm sure it won't be a, a problem at all. Sounds good. But I've never been to Northwest Arkansas. Some listeners out either. here are getting tickets to the future of supply chain. May not have been there. What what can we expect when we get out out into your stomping grounds? What's there to do around the area? Well, there's uh, we are one of the top bi- uh, mountain biking uh, destinations in the country. Um, so a I lot of bike. mountain biking trails, great hiking trails as well. Um, so if you're, if you're into that, that's sort of, we have uh, a fantastic art museum, Crystal Bridges. It's all funded by the Walton family. Um, obviously come out and see, check out JB Hunt while you're out there. Um, uh, man, my buddy Jordan Wright has a fantastic barbecue place out here uh, called Wright's Barbecue. There you go. Um, and, uh, during that weekend we have, uh, you know, Arkansas Razorbacks baseball going on. Uh, we'll probably have the Arkansas, uh, uh, the uh, Naturals, Northwest Arkansas Naturals uh, playing ball. That's the AA League of the Kansas City Royals. Damn. Um, and, of course, the event that you guys are bringing out. But there's all kinds of stuff to do up here in Northwest Arkansas, hiking, mountain biking, great food, uh, all kinds of really cool stuff. Well, I like it. Someone tells you a bad sauce awesome. call. Someone, someone tells you to take a hike. You've, all right. You got it done, man. Do you, you, I, I bet yeah. you got a golf course there, too. Well, Britain, yep, hey, we got a few golf courses out here. Yep, some great fishing. Uh, so, yeah. Britain, by the way, let me, I'll, I'll let you plug something here since you were nice enough, gracious enough to sing us a song. Uh, tell us about the Buffalo Way. I know that you, uh, you got yeah. a podcast, you're working on a book around this. I think one of your goals this year is to finish the book. What's the Buffalo Way? Wow, the Buffalo Way was actually, uh, it, it, it's a leadership initiative that a buddy of mine and I do. And Basically, we, we take the character, characteristics of the actual buffalo, the American bison, and uh, we see its characteristics of being strong, resilient, and completely useful. And so we want to develop leaders um, uh, wherever, whatever portion of life they may be in or whatever organization they're with. Our, our dream and goal is to develop leaders who lead uh, being strong, resilient, and completely useful to their team. Um, and so that's kind of the way of it. We're working on the book, uh, and um, we've taken a hiatus on the podcast right now, but we're hoping to get back to that uh, with, with the book project. But, uh, you know, if someone wants to know more about it, they can hit me up on LinkedIn. be happy to tell them um, if they'd like to, you know, for us to come in and talk to the organization or whatever it might be. Hey, let's, let's, let's talk about it. We're very passionate about developing team members who, who serve strong, resilient, and completely useful. Jose, by the way, Jose, who used to be over there at JB Hunt, he, Jose Socorro, he says, uh, oh, can, yeah, all right. uh, can dude, you and I meet for coffee when you're in NWA? Of course, yeah. Absolutely. You, you want to meet and greet with us? We're, we're sure. fully available when we're, when we're out there, aside from Let's when do we're it. doing shows and stuff. Maybe some barbecue as well. Wait, one more time, thank yeah. you so much for, for coming on the show. Appreciate it. Hey, fellas, thanks for having me. Always a pleasure. Take care. Awesome, man. By the way, yeah. congratulations to his uh, son, too. So one of Britain's yeah. big things is, is leadership and business, right. leadership in life, right? As he talked about with the Buffalo Way. His son, high school wrestler. Okay. First year, didn't win a single match. Worse. First I year, he's got shut up, blank, zero, sweep, <laughs> swept, swept the wrong way, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. This year, nine and one, best in the league. No kidding. Yeah. All right. There you go. See, it's not how many failures, it's how many times you stand back up. It really is. I mean, those are the most impressive things because, especially as you know, like I did wrestling in high school. In my first year, I sucked at it. Yeah. And I don't have the spirit that Burton's son does because I didn't go back to wrestling for my second year. Yeah, no, I sucked the whole time. And it was not, not just my first year. <laughs> so much cardio. It's just well, I did it to keep in running. shape because I did play basketball, but then I wasn't good enough really to play and start. But I wanted to stay in shape for football and track and stuff yeah. like that. So wrestling is just killer for staying in shape. Yeah, if That's they had like pro wrestling where they yeah. taught you like oh, the, nah, the you tricks go. and how there to take a go. bump and yeah. you know how to jump off a ladder and that kind of thing, yeah. I'd be all for it. There you go. Unfortunately, no. I'm with you.
Graham Gonzalez, Director of Strategic Accounts at Reliance Partners, is, is here, and we're going to talk about something that's really cool. We actually, uh, I think we got on this topic maybe a couple weeks ago, and it was usage-based yeah. insurance, but I think it's one of the first times we've actually talked about usage-based insurance. But we got to ask Graham something first, because we yep. did just have a play it forward, and what did you notice on his uh, well, he, he was So he was music director at a church in Los Angeles in, yeah. his, in his past there, and it, and usually, uh, you know, I've, I've played in churches and in, in Christian rock bands and stuff like that, so. So uh, he's a multi-instrument uh, instrumentalist. So, uh, instrumentalist. Yeah, so, so what do you play, curious, Graham? What do you play there, brother? Yeah, piano, guitar, bass, basically fill in anywhere they need me. I'm not. I'm at the office today, so I'm not going to break out the guitar. And uh, <laughs> that's a tough act to follow, but definitely fun to listen to. Okay, I owe you five bucks. I said it was like a. I said it was a theremin and a harmonica. <laughs> well, Graham, <laughs> Graham, Graham, That's Graham. the B team band. <laughs> so get us up to speed, man. This is this is an interesting and cool concept. What is usage based insurance for those who may not be aware? Great question. So I know that it's it's tough to switch gears and talk about insurance, which generally is someone uh, asleep compared to the bell of the ball, which it is in the event of some kind of claim with your company. Usage-based insurance is where a, a shipper, motor carrier, or freight broker is trying to get adequate coverage on either a strange commodity that's typically excluded, uh, otherwise a uh, maybe, I don't know, a really high-value load. So it, it's covering that. Can you all hear me okay? Oh, yeah. We got you, bro. <laughs> okay, great. So we're trying to get coverage so that no one is going underinsured. We're not trying to put any companies out of business by flying under the radar with lower coverage than necessary. So... In that regard, we're trying to protect the supply chain. So, uh, okay, explain to me exactly how this works. I'm a I'm a broker, and I need to, I need I'm thinking about I need to use this. How does this work? Of course, yeah. Let's say you're trying to win a shipper's business. You need to move a million dollar load. Your carrier pool is full of carriers with a cargo limit of a hundred thousand dollars. How can yeah. I find a way to win the shipper's business having trouble sourcing a motor carrier with the adequate million dollar limit of cargo coverage? You can quickly plug into a program or a spreadsheet. Um, basically the commodity, the value, and then you're going to have an instant quote for insurance. You can bind as in that moment, some programs take less than a minute to book. Some you can just book them whenever it's convenient and then be billed the next month. So there's a lot of different programs out there that are jumping into this now. Like, is there a catch it to it? On speed. Is there, is there a catch to it? Is there, is there like really high premiums or something like who does usage based insurance really benefit? It's because it sounds pretty good. I mean, I'm not saying too good to be true, but it sounds pretty good. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So we have motor carriers who use this. We have freight brokers who use this, and we have shippers who use this. It, it can benefit any piece of the supply chain. That's why it's, these programs are so awesome, and they're directed and built towards different pieces of that supply chain. So some are really shipper-friendly, some are really th- freight broker-friendly, and some are built specifically for motor carriers. So therein, we're finding everyone is able to get adequate coverage, and we're operating as safely as possible. So what are the positive benefits to the supply chain in general from a a process like this? Of course. Well, I can talk specifically on the 3PL front is we're helping to increase capacity within the capacity that already exists. So by that, I'm talking about optimization. We're able to utilize that carrier pool of $100,000 cargo coverage carriers, which is very standard, and we're able to have them move loads that are um, above that limit. So what we're doing essentially is adding in the piece of the supply chain, that high value cargo into the current carrier pool. So we're not missing out on shipper loads. We're helping 3PLs to win new shipper business. And so in that regard, we're just basically, we're brokering everyone working together in a more safe and efficient way and with different commodities and load values that were previously kind of unattainable for smaller brokerages and carriers. So why did it take so long for insurance companies to realize the huge opportunity in offering a streamlined product like this? (laughs) <laughs> that's that's the great question. So traditionally, it's going to take maybe, depending on the size of the brokerage, let's say it's using this, um, an insurance company could get a contingent cargo policy from that broker for $6,000, $10,000, let's say, if it's on the smaller end. Meanwhile, it's going to take a couple months of usage-based insurance to equal that same contingent policy. So it's not been a priority for a lot of these bigger insurers. Meanwhile, some smaller, more agile and tech-minded insurance companies are specifically targeting the segment. And so in that they're actually winning a huge amount of market share. Yeah, so Graham, we, we noticed that in a in, in a previous slice, you, you you worked at WeWork and got to interview hundreds of, of smaller startup uh, companies. Sure. I would imagine, I'd imagine oh, you had yeah. plenty of experience there that was beneficial in identifying the needs of smaller companies. Can you enlighten us? 
Of course. Yeah, that was an incredibly consultative role in which I exactly that I got to meet founders, entrepreneurs from, you know, new venture sales organizations to sitting down with, um, you know, the C team of, you know, some of these Nikes, uh, gym passes, some of these really large organizations setting up remote offices. And so taking a consultative approach to, I mean, that's specifically office space and how to scale an organization, but how that translates into logistics, logistics is, it's the, I mean, I'd say it's the same thing. I'm meeting with founders, entrepreneurs who are trying to grow and scale their business and do so in the safest manner possible. Wow. Exciting stuff. It's almost like being a podcast host working at, at WeWork. It, it almost sounds talking to yeah, so many different startups. Right. <laughs> founders, uh, in, in another life, maybe you'll join us up, up here at Back to Truck Up, Graham. Uh, anyways, but people who are interested <laughs> in this single usage insurance or anything that Reliance offers, where do I send them to? You can just send them to ReliancePartners.com. We'll make sure to take great care of them. Okay. We trust right you, Graham. On. Thanks for joining stuff, us. Don't Graham. be a stranger. Hope to we'll see you again soon. And maybe next time, bring that instrument with you. Sounds great. And Thank you. All. Take care. Yeah, he's got enough to choose from. You could think he could bring one. He, yeah, he does. <laughs> and I can't all, he, he's listed like every instrument but the theremin. Yeah, I was completely, exactly. <laughs> I was completely effing wrong. Um, <laughs> with fully furnished state-of-the-art repair trucks and a full array of roadside tools, you can expect the safest, fastest, and most painless oh, yeah. response for your free fleet from Love's Truck Care and Speed Co. To learn more... Tell them, dude. Hey, go to loves.com immediately after this show. Let's take a look at a video Let's from do our that. next guest here. Okay. They're doing something really interesting. Ooh. They're planting some trees for every load that is shipped. It's a lot of trees. Yeah, there's about do you 800... have to ship with them in order to get it planted? There's about 838 <laughs> billion trees in the United States, but we're losing... How many hectares? Was it like a hectare? Two, uh, 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 two, uh, no, uh, yeah, a hectare every second. A hectare every second. Yeah. So in just that time that we said that, we've lost five hectares. It's a lot of hectares. How many loads does it take to fill a hectare? <sighs> How many trees are in a hectare? That's two point something acres. Depends on the diameter of the tree, I would imagine. We were trying to do some math. Is it an African well, it or really European cool. swallow? Cool initiative. Freight Vani, you might have seen them around. They're a relatively newer company. Came on the scene just at the end of last year. We have their co-founder, uh, their co-CEO and founder, Shannon Breen on today. Shannon, welcome to What the Truck for the first time. Got to give you a little cowbell, brother. <laughs> Hey, thanks, gentlemen. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. So you're the co-founder here. That means you had some say in this name. So let me ask you, I've always been curious, as long as I've seen Freight Vana, is it derivative of Nirvana, Carvana, or Vana White? Uh, definitely Vana White. Uh, <laughs> that was really the passion behind the whole business. You know, when you get into trucking, you think about her and her influence on the world, and you just want to replicate that for, for generations <laughs> yeah. to come. You're right. A true American <laughs> hero. I love, it. I, I love it, shit. Hey, I grew up with it. I can't believe she still turned letters out there, her and Pat. Uh, yeah, God bless it's not how many so times you fail, it's how many times you stand back up. That's <laughs> Vanna White right like there. He's like that wrestler. Well, <laughs> Shannon, you. tell us a little bit, though. Just, just set the table real quick. People haven't heard of Freight Vanna yet. You guys are uh, you're, you're making a lot of noise over on LinkedIn and stuff. What's cool about you guys and why you found the company? Yeah, I would just say, hey, we, we, we founded the company with a lot of experience in the industry. We have uh, a, a team that, that, that's built on uh, the back of a lot of industry experience on both the tech side, the operations side. Um, and the real goal and mission, honestly, guys, is just to show up a little bit differently. Um, you know, everybody says they're going to kind of change the industry, but we feel like we've got a path and a plan um, to do it. And so uh, we made a big announcement recently on, on obviously the trailers that we're, we're going to be putting into the market strategically um, in the months and ahead. And so we're just really excited about what that brings to our shippers door and changes, you know, some of the dynamics that exist. And then on this one tree planted front, um, really kind of change the paradigm of some of the conversations and, you know, how people are putting together uh, plans for sustainability or supporting the efforts. And I feel like as an intermediary, there's, you know, I've been kind of watching and, been a part of some different planning sessions and looking at it and you know the why is we look at it and said hey is there something tangible we could do um and not for ourselves right i think uh you know shout out to, to michael and right what he does with with the uh, ocean seven like i think that's special right like lead the charge be a champion invite others to join and participate um and i just felt like from a logistics intermediary standpoint uh, finding this group, doing our research, and then inviting others to join was just going to be something that was so fulfilling and needed um, in the marketplace, to be honest. No, it's really cool stuff, and thanks for that shout-out, uh, Shannon. I appreciate that. Uh, can you explain exactly how the program works? 
Yeah, uh, One Tree Plan is really, I mean, if you go into OneTreePlanet.org, I mean, you get so much information. You see how the organization is structured, but essentially they have a mission and a commitment for every dollar you donate, they plant a tree. And so, you know, and we, we did some posts on this. Very simple, right? So every load we haul, think about we're committing $1 um, mm-hmm. to to the reforestation efforts of, of One Tree Planet. Well, how many, I mean, this could get expensive. How many trees do you plan on planting? How many do you, how many you estimate you'll plant in this year? Fast growing, rapidly growing. These uh, trees, costs could get out of control, Shannon. Yeah, if you're too successful, we could yeah. get out, run out of space for these trees. Dude. Yeah. It's the, the worry. Hey, we're, we're probably one of the faster growing logistics companies in the country, but I would say um, we will plant even this year tens of thousands of trees. Uh, and the coolest part of the program when you really get uh, into it is you can actually select where you want those trees to be planted to. So we've had a lot of fun with our shippers. Um, there's some regions, some areas where they have high density, um, and we're even working with our shippers, uh, you know, kind of earmark where they want uh, the trees planted for the business we're doing together. So you get this very um, healthy, positive loop of working with your shippers, picking where the trees are going to be going. Um, but to answer your question, tens of thousands, and hey, as we scale, and you look at some of the larger logistics companies in the country, like um, I believe we can be a company that's planting hundreds of thousands of trees every single year, and that that is a, a pretty special thing to think about as we grow our business here. Yeah, it really is. And you, you mentioned that people can select where they want this um, uh, tree planted, I, I guess, like the deforestation of the rainforest, that type of stuff. So I've got a question for you to follow up that actually, too. Can it be your backyard that I select? And can I pick the type of tree? <laughs> uh, they do have different types of trees and, and the stuff that you select. Um, different regions, you know, they are, they are, they are deep. here's the cool intersection, right, on that question, Michael. They are, and you watch what they do and how they do it. Yeah. the analytics, uh, the research, the science behind it. So you're not going to be able to, I mean, they're looking at the indigenous species in certain regions. I mean, they do so much work. Um, and then depending on the region, they'll probably have the types of trees selected. Um, and you can't do someone's backyard. So I can't, uh, you know, block out a nice tree line for you. So your neighbors can't peek over the fence, Michael, but, um, you Just can pick to... something in a region. They've even got some new programs that are pretty cool with like national parks and stuff. If, if you're passionate about that, if, gotcha. if anybody's company uh, wants to support that type of thing. I, I, wanted, well. I wanted some nice bamboo in, in Dooner's front yard. You always you help me out bamboo. with that. You know what grows really quick. What bamboo else, some grows like crazy. How about some kudza? You know what kudza, kudza. does to a yard? Yeah, take okay. you out, man. It's an invasive species. It's not a tree, dude. Well, Shane, it's let me, not okay, a tree. Shane, so the Freightonomics guys, uh, Anthony Smith and Zach Strickland, they were in the locker room here this morning because they were doing Freightways Now. Yeah. So I told them that you were coming on and you're planting a tree per load. So I had a problem for them that I wanted them to solve. And it was if every freight company were to plant a tree per load, how long do you think it would take for America just to be covered in trees? And they broke it down for me and they told me that um, they couldn't solve it, right? Because at a certain point, well, for one, it's really hard to figure out like how many trees take up space and all that thing. And it's really hard to figure out the trucking industry, how many loads exactly are booked. Yeah, but there's more to that. Yeah. Well, at a certain point, you won't be able to complete the project, right? Yeah, you start choking off your own bloodstream. Yeah, yeah, you start cutting out your own productivity. You start building too many trees around the roads or the ports. You can't, you know, you won't be making, you won't have the loads to make the money to plant the trees. Yeah, that's right. That's exactly right. Shannon, before Yeah, from a science perspective, right? And and I'm not the the deep math guy, but if you look at it, you kind of give just a general idea. Because you think about the cool part about planting trees is, and this is, you know, makes perfect sense, is that, hey, that tree is going to last decades. Right. So every year you get the net benefit of every tree you plant, but it's not a one time event. As that tree matures and grows, it continues, um, you know, to produce more positive benefits for the environment. So it's it's truly this, you know, kind of like insurance. Right. It's going to continue to to roll and roll and roll and then have this huge effect. Um, and typically, you know, and, and I don't want to get too even to the math, but from a math perspective for those guys behind the curtains for you guys, like and it depends on what you're looking at. Every time you plant a tree offsets somewhere near about 30% of the effects of a standard like kind of 500, 500 mile trip in its lifetime. So, um, you know, it's not taking out the full effects of, of the, the carbon and, and the offsets that there is, but it's a significant piece. And so every time you're planting, you're, you're taking a little bit of edge off the impact of the environment. And to your point, you know, if everybody did it, then it would be, I mean, it would be wild what would happen. Like kind of that's that yeah. big question. Like what if everybody did this? 
Yeah. Sure. And we well, only have like 77 years left of the rainforest at this pace. Uh, that's uh, what I'm could, could be. I don't know. No, that, no, they got a counter going on right now. That's where those hectares are are coming out every every second. <laughs> well, maybe the supply chain industry can say this. Maybe this yeah. isn't such a maybe this not maybe not every freight company, but if freight companies in different regions started doing this, it would be great. Could it would be. be great. Shannon, just before well, that, we let you go, the, and that's the part we've had. No, no, real quick. I just said there's a lot of support already happening, right? I mean, Forkite did something the other day. They're doing a sustainability conference for everybody that attends. They're now supporting the One Tree Planted effort. That's really cool. And I've been reached out by many companies that are supporting it too. So we're already seeing the net benefit of it, kind of uh, trying to help lead the charge and make people more aware. But uh, it's been really awesome uh, in yeah. the early stages. You, you mentioned those trailers too at the beginning of this, this interview, and I don't think we've covered those on the show. I think oh, there's yeah, an article yeah. on FreightWaves.com. Can you just tell us real quick what's going on with that? Uh, uh, in passing, to me, it sounded pretty cool, but I'd like to know a little bit more from you. Yeah, I would just say, for, uh, you think about the industry, right? The, if you look at the 1 to 100 tri size truck fleets, right? They make up 65, 70% of the overall industry, right? From a capacity standpoint, they have been really significantly disadvantaged by the inability to buy uh, equipment, especially in the market that we're in. Um, and so in order to tap into that capacity and the shippers, um, we have decided and gone pretty heavy uh, on an investment strategy to to bring kind of gray pool market trailers to the market. Typically, you see a lot of that. Um, my prior employer, as well as some of the large asset-based companies, all have some additional capacity they offer. Um, but a lot of our shippers we're looking at was a trusted third party with asset experience that could work collaboratively with them to do the analysis and find opportunities to deploy those trailers. Such a benefit for the shippers on an efficiency perspective with, with warehouse uh, challenges and hiring challenges and such a major advantage in, for the small carriers who typically don't get to haul that freight because they don't have the trailer pools to support those efforts. So mm. it, it, it's, you know, uh, core to our mission here as far as changing and helping uh, evolve the industry, you know, and I'm, I'm glad you're asking about it, but it's a big investment at the same time. And as an intermediary, most folks don't make that type of capital investment, but we feel very confident um, with our partnerships on um, both the carriers and the shipper side um, that we can get it done. And so we're really excited. We've got a thousand coming online this year. Um, we're already <laughs> pretty, uh, I wouldn't say oversubscribed, but we've got a lot of partners that are lining up um, to, to put these into their, their markets. And so uh, it's an adventure that will last far beyond this year, but we we're excited to see where it takes us. Awesome. Yeah. That's a great idea. Really That's cool. A great idea. Well, Shannon, how do uh, people connect with you? How do they work with your team, plant some trees, and uh, use some of these trailers? Yeah, I'd say, hey, number one, if you're interested in the One Tree Planted, uh, onetreeplanted.org. Um, I have personal contacts with, with a lot of the folks there. So uh, DM me on LinkedIn, as you mentioned, and I can get you in touch with the, the, the group there. Um, for, for me, uh, hit me up on LinkedIn personally or, or, or send us an email at hello at freightvana.io. Uh, we can answer any questions, and we'd be more than uh, more than welcoming to anybody that, that wants to put a program together to support the effort. We love it. The team is great at One Tree Planet, and uh, it's tangible, and it means something. And, and, and we're hoping to get a, a similar following, Michael, to what you have with Ocean 7 and continue to, to facilitate positive change uh, for the long term. Right on. And I mean, even if it's not trees or ocean plastics like I'm doing here, if it inspires you to go, you know what, maybe I can do something. That's worth it, man. It's all worth it. If you knock somebody else's it's, brain in head. Michael, you know, it, you know it's that first step, right? Like that's everybody, right. it's that first step of really making that commitment. And, and that's where it's been so special to see a couple of these companies jump in and jump into the water with us and, and, and come up with great solutions on their own. And it doesn't need to be what we're doing, but hey, you just got to take the first step and, and make it a part of what you do. And the last thing I'd share with you guys is, because we're in this this hyper-competitive hiring environment, you know what's really special? I've got three people on my team where if you interviewed them today, guys, and you asked them, why are you here? They saw One Tree Planted, and they go. knew we were doing stuff differently, and they wanted to be a part of it. So for everybody out there saying, hey, man, I wish I could find some good, talented people, I've got three people on my team right now that have joined us in the last two months just because of that effort, and that wasn't even the reason why we did it but it's special the way people rally around it and they want to come work with companies that are doing more than just standard business. 
Yeah, it's 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 a, the numbers are there. A company with a strong ESG or, or good corporate oh, social sure. responsibility, they attract better talent, they retain better talent. Um, so yeah, you're absolutely right. It's it's a place people can get behind. Not only just the services the company's providing, but a yeah, good guys, for young the people aren't a bunch. Little, little young people aren't a bunch of dirtbags like us. They no. actually, they're you know they're altruistic. They That's care right. about other people. They care about other things. They care, <laughs> <laughs> they care about sustainability. And good on them. Good on you, young people. You're inheriting the earth. So I'm glad you care about one tree planted. We do too. Amen. That's why we had Shannon on. Shannon, one more time, thank you to you and the team over there. Best luck. We hope you plant a lot of trees. Appreciate you, fellas. Thanks for all the support. Take it easy. That's right, man. All right, now let's talk to Tim Valdez, SVP and factor lead at Triumph Pay. And he has the honor of actually joining us on video because we got our video system back Sweet. up. So we're going to see Tim live and in living color. Tim, thanks for joining us. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me on the show. I appreciate it. Now, are you over in uh, Texas with the rest of the Triumph Pay team? I am. I commute back and forth a lot. I actually live in Salt Lake City, but I come back and forth to Dallas. And so I picked and decided to bring the bad weather with me today in yeah. Dallas. <laughs> I was going to say, you're getting a lot of ice today? We are. It's starting to, starting to show up a little bit here. Yeah. I think the worst is still to come, but we'll, we'll, get, we'll get through it. <laughs> well, I imagine we will. Worst well, one of the things we're here life. to talk about today is factoring and trying to you guys are experts on that. And one of the reasons we wanted to talk about it is because business is booming in factoring. I mean, there's so many freight invoices out there. Sure. It stands to reason that factoring companies would be processing a ton of them. Um, but the thing about factoring as well, cash intensive business like trucking, right? Sure. They find, factoring fine is like 50 to 60 percent of invoices. As transaction volumes continue to increase, though, what's the best decision that companies can make to avoid some of the undue risks associated with getting these payment processes and uh, to have some security and peace of mind? I think you have to look at it a couple of different ways is, is one. And, and Shannon mentioned, mentioned it in the prior, the prior interview is that the labor market is very tight. And so you have to figure out ways as a factoring company to become much more efficient. And a challenge with that is if you look at the basic factoring transaction, we're taking a piece of paper provided to us by a carrier, and which is in essence a promise to pay. And we have to figure out the validity of that. Is our carrier the one that hauled the load? Is the carrier, is the amount correct? Uh, and all these other things that are done manually. And, and historically, they've been done through picking up the phone, calling the bra broker community to verify load amounts and so forth. And, and one of the th exciting things about what we're doing at Triumph Pay is we have the ability now through our network transactions to automate a lot of that process. Now, brokers don't want to have a factoring company burning up their phone all day trying to verify loads and, and, and if the carrier hauled the load and so forth and the amount that's due but when you look at the factor side of it is we have this piece of paper that says, I promise that this is worth a thousand dollars and you'll be paid a thousand dollars. And the factor is making decisions in a very narrow window. And so by integrating with what we do on the triumph pay side, if we are taking a lot of that friction, a lot of those pain points out of the equation and doing a lot of it in an automated fashion. Yeah. You know, and it, when you look at the entire business or the entire industry as well, Tim, you, you look at what we've gone through this year. The entire industry is being affected by all kinds of stuff. The supply chain issues with labor shortages, yeah. right? Uh, we have canals getting suezed every once in a while. And, you know, there's all the volatility that is going on. What really is the best strategy for the brokers to, to get in there and maximize their efficiencies and bring the best value for their customers? And I, and I think that... The interesting thing is the, the challenge that the brokers have is very similar to the factors is the brokers, their, their job and what they make money on is, is placing freight and moving freight. And the more that they have to spend on these non-revenue producing tasks, the worse it can be. And so the advantage of having Triumph Pay in the mix is that Triumph Pay integrates with TMS systems and we can get feeds directly into our network that can communicate to the factoring community without all the pressures of the phone calls and, and, and everything else that goes along with, with that side of it. The other big part, I think a, a huge advantage for the brokering community is that when you run into that load, that's a problem. It's a challenge. There might be some damage or some other dispute that's going on with that load. I think the advantage Triumph Pay brings to that mix is that you have the ability to create uh, within the system very quickly a dispute and that can be resolved in utilizing the factoring community to help resolve that. I mean, the bottom line is the factoring community is providing a lot of liquidity to the carrier and they have a captive audience when it comes to solving disputes and helping a broker work through that. So it's a way, the Triumph Pay Network is a way to co coordinate those efforts between the broker, the carrier, and the factor. 
So everybody wins in that scenario. Tim, we love freight tech over here. So I'm curious about what are some of the next gen innovations in eliminating bottlenecks in communication and payments methods? I think there's a lot that we can do that we have just scratched the surface. Uh, when we know the transactions that are happening and we know the carriers uh, that are hauling those and we know a lot about the, the flow of freight, I think we're going to be able to offer some really cool things like heat mapping and, and provide other tools that the brokers and factoring community can utilize. Uh, we can also provide information to the brokers as far as you know, carriers, the quality of the carriers that are out there. We can provide information to the factoring companies about the quality of the broker and the communication levels of the brokers. So it's it's kind of a opening up a communication channel, but not only communication because that's you know that's nothing really new. Everybody wants to communicate and do it better. But the reality is using technology to anticipate the movement of freight. And when you have a issue with a climate like we're having in Dallas today and, and freight needs to be rerouted, I think there's a lot of really cool analytics that we're going to be able to pull out of the network that's going to solve some of that predicting that needs to be done in the movement of freight throughout the U.S., Makes a lot of sense. I'm just curious, because you mentioned yeah. the data there. What does a supply chain crisis look like from a, a factor's eyeballs, right? When you're looking at some of these data, are, are payment cycles taking longer, cash cycles taking longer, all of those kind of things? What, what do you see? Like, what do you glean when you look at that? So we, we see a variety of things is, is not only you have weather events, but you have capacity issues and capacity constraints and the port issues that you've talked about previously. And and anytime there's a a diversion and this, the smooth movement of freight, it usually has a cost associated with that. You know, if you've got to go out a route, that carrier is going to be paid more money. Uh, the factor typically will look at a lane and know that a particular lane is going to pay a certain amount of money. And if a carrier submits a load that's excessively higher, they're going to have uh, some pause and, and want to dig in deeper. And so we can give them some sort of a sanity check as far as what that the guardrails of any given lane may be as far as pricing and, and what to anticipate, but also to look at the direction freight is moving. And if it's you know a seasonal slowdown or if there's weather events or whatever it may be, I think we'll be very positioned very well to predict those changes in the environment. Wow. Hey, yeah. Tim, you thank you that. so much. People want to learn more about Triumph Pay and get involved in the factoring. Where do we send them to? So you can look, you can actually reach out to me directly and through LinkedIn or, uh, Go to triumphpay.com. We have several ways you can contact us through Triumph Pay. The factors com factoring community will reach out directly to me or anybody for that matter. I, at my email is tvaldez at triumphpay.com. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much for your time today. We appreciate it. Take care. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Enjoy that time out in uh, SLC, Dallas SLC. Nice little trip. Yeah, it's not a bad flight, and uh, both are kind of cool. <laughs> I like both cities, actually. <laughs> speaking of that market, speaking of factoring, yeah. it is expensive. Last week, we looked at contract rates. They're up a dollar year over year. Um, this week, I think the spot rate's kind of around the same place it was. Your FSC's yep. probably going through the roof, though. Um, what about contract rates, though? In Zach Strickland's chart of the week, right? He reported, I'm going to read you a sentence here, okay. and you break this down for me. He said, contract rates for dry van truckload have increased roughly 25% over the past year, or 59 cents per mile, according to FreightWave's invoice data. In the meantime, carrier compliance rates for accepting electronic requests for capacity have only improved to 81.9% from 78.5%. What does that mean? Okay, well, um, yeah, what, a better way to look... Contract rates have gone up, and shippers yeah. have been willing to, to pay better rates, and they've been renegotiating in, in sl smaller and smaller cycles yeah. because you see that jump more. It's usually like this type of thing, right? And now you're seeing it jump a little bit more. So they're trying to secure that, that capacity that's going there. There's just not enough capacity to, to, to handle all, that, all of that volume is, is there, so it only imp can only improve it so much. There's only a, so much uh, a contracted freight that the contracted capacity can handle. Mm. And once it leaves an area it's now displaced, right? So the long haul, the longer the haul of, of, of capacity moving, like say out of Southern California, et cetera, eventually it gets displaced because it gets caught up in these different spider webs. You talk about the Northeast, we talk about that all the time, going into the Northeast. Some of these carriers get caught in that Northeast and they can't get back out of that Northeast because there's not long haul coming out of there. 
You know what I mean? So it, so it changes different things. So even though volumes are still at 15,000 or way up there as high as we've ever seen them, yeah. and contract rates are soaring as high as we've ever seen them and going higher, there's still not enough capacity out there to handle 100% of it. People have been wanting to call the top for a long time. Yeah. Now, we look at these charts within Sonar, contract, and spot, and um, yeah. the top keeps going up. <laughs> it's, uh, oddly enough, the top Every has. time we draw one, it seems to it's change. It's not cyclical, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Are we at the top? Let me ask you that. I, I think we're very, I think we're very near it, and maybe there. But you know, the thing is, you, it it changes all the time, like you like you said. And when you start looking at uh, those indicators that are far upstream or removed, really from the, you know, looking at the number of loads, et cetera, and imports, and you start looking at consumers, actions speak louder than words, like Anthony likes to say, right? Look at consumer sentiment; it's not real high, but they're buying the hell out of everything. <laughs> I mean, our, the imports are still coming, my friend. Well, we have a new index in Sonar, the Inbound Ocean Shipments Index, yes, right? Yes, yes, And we that do. is showing a uh, that's showing a, a, a burst, right, of activity yeah. that is about to come through. Now, those bookings they have to confirm and roll through, and all those sure. Things. But it looks like there's going to be a lot of cargo to sustain it, us. So. It, it will moderate some as yeah. it happens, because in that particular one, you will see people purchase uh, a capacity in the anticipation that there won't be any available. So there is some of that spec that's in there that'll come out of that and it'll smooth a little bit. But yeah, no, the, you, you look at the ocean shipments, you look at the IOT, uh, uh, what is it, the IOTI and the IO, uh, IOSI, yeah. um, which is TEUs versus shipments, both showing things going up. Actually, the IOSI, which is number of shipments, is down a little bit, but the containers are up, which means bigger amounts of freight. Speaking of ocean shipments, great article just published on FreightWaves.com. Collusion drumbeat leads to multilateral probe of shipping lines. Go to FreightWaves.com. Read that one by Eric Coolish. Antitrust regulators in five nations respond to freight complaints of exploitive behavior during supply chain crisis. Friday on the show, NASA's is back on here, and we also have the Florida Pilots Association. It's going to be really exciting. Sea and space. Love Follow it. me on Twitter, at Timothy Dooner. Come work it back the truck up, right? Go fill those up. Yeah, man, do Find it. Vincent the dude. Tell him how to be with the rest hey, of this afternoon. Peace and love. Spread it everywhere.